Good evening. We're ready to begin. This planning commission meeting is called to order. The special planning commission meeting is called to order. This meeting has been properly noticed and posted in compliance with the open meeting law. These proceedings are being video recorded as well as presented live on KCLV cable channel 2 and are closed captioned for our hearing impaired, impaired viewers. Please note customers of CenturyLink and Cox Communications can view this program in high definition on channel 1002. You can also watch this meeting live on Apple TV and Roku on the Go Vegas app. The Planning Commission meeting as well as other KCLV programming can be viewed on the internet at www.kclv.tv forward slash live. The proceedings will be rebroadcast on KCLV channel 2 and the web the Saturday of the meeting at 10 a.m., Monday at midnight, and the following Tuesday at 6 p.m. Would everyone please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? Madam Clerk, can we have the roll call, please? Chair Cherry? Chair, uh, here. <laughs> Vice Chair Quinn? Here. Commissioner Schlotman? Present. Commissioner Toussaint? Here. Commissioner Rausch? Present. Commissioner DeSavio? Present. Commissioner Williams? Present. Thank you. Thank you. To the public, I call your attention the information printed in your agenda concerning our actions and the appeal and review process, if appropriate. Please read this carefully, and if you have any questions, staff is available on both sides here. Also, the second page of the agenda contains our rules of conduct. We appreciate you adhering to these rules so we can have a smooth meeting. Uh, there are agendas on both sides, or on this side of the uh, pony wall, if anyone needs one. Moving on to item number four, public comment during this portion of the agenda must be limited to matters on the agenda for action. If you wish to be heard, come to the podium, give your name for the record, the amount of discussion, as well as the amount of any time single speakers allowed may be limited. All comments under this item for specific actions will be cross-referenced to those items. Are there any members of the public who wish to speak under this portion of the agenda? Get your name and address, please, for the record. Mr. Chairman, Nathan Taylor, 8414 West Warm Road. Uh, just a quick question, Mr. Chairman. Um, item number nine, um, is that a public hearing? Item number nine is a public hearing item. Um, it looks like there is, a, there is a request for an abeyance on this item, though. Okay, so then I'll reserve my comments, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Can you get your name and address for the record, please? Hi, good afternoon, Chairman, uh, members of the Commission. For the record, Erin McMullen on behalf of Boyd Gaming, uh, 6465 South Rainbow Boulevard, Las Vegas, Nevada, 89118. Um, I was just coming to speak right now because Commissioner um, Councilman Coffin alerted us to this, obviously, and that there are three short-term rental ordinances on today's agenda. So we really haven't had full time to digest those and sort of how they operate all together. Um, potentially, just in my initial reading, it looks like some of them could conflict, but hearing that there might be an abeyance on some or all of them. I just wanted to put on the record that we are looking into it and would be happy to work with the councilman and any of the other um, members who are working on this moving forward. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Noted. Get your name and address for the record, please. Good afternoon, Chairman. Justin Michaels, 820 Rancho Lane. Uh, for item number eight, um, I just became aware of this item today. I unfortunately don't read the hard paper anymore. So, and I didn't see anything in the mail for it as far as the notice for this meeting. So I'm just learning about this literally as we go. Okay. So I don't know if it's uh, even possible to consider an abeyance on this item. You know, at this point, th that item was held last month. There was a discussion. Okay. There wasn't a vote, but there was a pretty robust uh, presentation at that meeting and discussion. Um, and the, the idea is that we would... They would solicit comments from now until then if there was further comments from the public and then we'd go to a void at, vote at this point. Okay. So I, I think that's that's where we're sitting at the moment. So. Okay. I'll come up back for comments then. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Can I get your name and address, please, for the record? Thanks. My name is Jeff Belcher, um, 150 Las Vegas Boulevard North. 
the Ogden. Um, I just wanted to confirm procedurally that uh, we'll be able to speak later on when we get to our particular agenda item, or do we need to speak now during public comment? Uh, when there's a uh, agenda item, um, and that is called forward, um, you'll have the opportunity, uh, if it's heard tonight and not obeyed, to be able to speak during that portion of okay, it. Okay, just wanted to make sure. Thank yeah. you. Okay, uh, seeing no one else, we will move on to item number five. Uh, for possible action, any items, uh, are there any items that the commissioners, staff, applicants, or the public would like to pull forward for action? Does anyone wish to speak on any of these items? If yes, note and allow discussion to be turned if they should stay under the housekeeping items to be heard as scheduled. If no, do we have anyone that, on the commission here that needs to, no? Okay. Hearing none, Commissioner Quinn, Vice Chair Quinn, uh, could we get a motion on the housekeeping items? Commissioner, uh, I mean, uh, Chairman, uh, could I ask uh, what, what the reason is for holding number nine in abeyance? Yeah, if we could uh, have staff. Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, um, item number nine and number 12 have been requested to be held in abeyance uh, due to possible future direction by the council that requested the items. Uh, as well as allow for additional staff time to address those uh, concerns and direction from the council. Commissioner Slavin, did you have any further questions to that? I don't know. I, we just called a special meeting for this, so I figured we, we would discuss this and move it on to city council, but I guess if they want to make additional comments, and we can hold it and, um, and listen to it at our next meeting. Okay. Commissioner DeSalvio. I was just curious who asked for the hold on those two. Mr. Chairman, through you. So, uh, Councilman, or Commissioner, the request was made in both of these cases by the council people that are working on them. Um, there's actually a coalition of council members that are actively involved in this conversation. Um, there's been, even as of just uh, the beginning of the week, some additional changes that were requested, which is why uh, item number 12 was requested to be held. Uh, the sponsor working on uh, the item 9 uh, amendment wants that one to go with the rewrite uh, amendment so that they can kind of be heard uh, together in terms of a policy decision that the council will ultimately make and that this body would make a recommendation on. Thank you. Um, through you, uh, Chairman Cherry, how many people are in attendance this evening? If you could raise your hand that came down here just to speak on item number nine. Um, thank you. Well, it would be my suggestion if they choose, they could um, put their um, opinion on the record. Um, they've come all this way and um, I think if it's appropriate, they should be able to make a comment um, that goes on the record today. And thank you, Vice Chair. And I, I will say, um, you know, I feel at the same group, and it's important everyone's heard, but I will say that there will be back at the next time that it is heard for probably more robust discussion with better facts to, if it is obeyed, to discuss on. And, and so, uh, you know, following that, I'd be willing to open it up for maybe a minute a person. I just didn't want to get into redundancy and then have to go back to another meeting on the same thing. Well, through you, um, Chairman, that certainly is your call. Um, it, it, maybe this will help. On a, on a show of hands, it, it is nine and <coughs> nine and twelve that are being held. We still have. Item number 11 that's specific to mixed use in multifamily. Uh, maybe we could show hands of people that want to speak on that as well. So if you live in the Ogden, I saw some Ogden shirts. This would apply to the Ogden people. Okay, so four people. Okay. Um, all right, so we, we, can, we can go along with that. Uh, so what, what we'll do is... Uh, being that this is the public comment portion, um, uh, what we'll do is, is give each person a minute to go on the record. But I, I really don't want to get into redundancy, folks. So if, you, if someone here is 
if you hear it before from the person before you, if you could just say I'm opposed or uh, for this, that would help us understand. Because I will say this is, even with the advance, this will come back at a meeting at some point, and there's going to be a larger discussion. Um, and we're just trying to get through the agenda timely as well. So uh, again, all the comments are important, but I, I do want to try to get through it as fast as possible. So if we could start forming three lines. Do we, do we need to vote uh, on an abeyance first, or does it matter at this point? Um, you can go ahead and take the comments first. Okay, thank you. So if, we, if the people that want to come up and speak on those items, we have three microphones. We'll give each person a minute, and I'll need your name and address for the record. And again, if we could not be redundant on it, that'd be great. Mr. Chairman, uh, Commissioner Nathan Taylor, 8414 West Farm Road. Uh, I'll be very brief, um, as you're only giving me 60 seconds. So um, I just wanted to just remind all of us um, that this ordinance was passed a year ago to regulate an industry that was operating illegally. I think that's very, very important for us to remember. Because as you know, I've represented many, many applications for good short-term rental operators before this board over the past year. My concern is this. We have thousands of illegal short-term rentals operating in Clark County right now. Las Vegas is the only place where it's legal and regulated. I lived next to someone for two years who had a two-year lease and made my and my wife's life a living hell. I would have rather had a short-term rental next to me with some of the reputable short-term rental people we have in this community living next door to me than what I had to deal with for two years. This is a point I made a year ago and I'm just bringing it up again. I think it's crucial as a city and I'm a citizen as well, not to say represent clients, but that we do the right thing and make sure that we regulate things that could negatively impact our lives. And unfortunately, this industry can and has negatively impacted people's lives. And by regulating this and doing the right thing and having the ability to make decisions here and revoke special use permits and put people out of business who don't care about this community, that's the way to go. So I appreciate uh, you guys listening to my concerns tonight. Thank, Thank you. you. And, and like I mentioned, there will be a, a larger, uh, more robust discussion in the future when this is an agenda item. Thank you for your comments, Mr. Taylor. Can you get your name and address for the record, please? Yes, sir. My name is Rayleigh Silver. Um, I live out in the Summerlin area, uh, 1808 Cedar Bluffs Way. Um, there are two houses in my uh, small subdivision that are looking to uh, be short-term rentals. Our neighborhood has a lot of small children that like to run everywhere. and most of the time they have minimal supervision. My main concern is that having these two, three, four day rentals are gonna bring individuals into that neighborhood that these kids could get involved in that are not so good. Um, I'm also opposed just because uh, we just bought that house and I really don't want my property values to go down and I don't want my home insurance to go up because of concerns. Thank you for Thank your you comments. Sir. Thank you. Can you get your name and address for the record, please? Sure. Chris Jones. Address is 7811 Dana Point Court. I oppose STRs. Um, my, my point is um, I actually live on a private street, I, uh, and so do a number of our neighbors in this neighborhood there where I live, and that street is owned by the homeowners, no one else. The city does not own those streets. So my concern, number one, is who asked us if it was okay to have strangers come on our street and increase the liability if they were to fall, hit their head, or whatever they happened to do in their drunken, disorderly way, because a lot of that has happened already. Um, that's a concern. My other concern is security. Even whether it's the Ogden or it's a single residential home, these are strangers, and these are not people that live in Las Vegas that are just coming to, to take a house for a day or whatever they do. These are people who are coming out of town, from out of town, and it's the what stays in Vegas, you know, that whole thing. And quite frankly, they're out at all hours of the night, and they are causing, we already went through the violations. I, I, need, to, I need to wrap up. Yeah. On the so anyway, so um, this is not being managed today. The city doesn't have enough money to manage it, and so the security uh, is a risk. Thank you, for, thank you for your comments. Can you get your name and address for the record, please? Terry Lawrence, 2241 Diamond Bar Drive. I oppose. Thank you, Mr. Lawrence. Thank you for your comments. Name and address, please, for the record. Barbara Harrison, 2031 Diamond Bar, 89117. I oppose. Thank you, Barbara Harrison. I appreciate the comment. Joan Tiberi, 2121 South Buffalo. And I'm definitely opposed to short-term rentals in residential areas. Thank you. Thank you for coming up. 
Dina Cianchetti, D-I-N-A-C-I-A-N-C-H-E-T-T-I, 2241 Diamond Bar Drive, Las Vegas, Nevada, 89117. We are all opposed. We, the security has been an issue. She's not, the people that are doing the Airbnb, if you look, they're not paying, the, they're paying the same property tax we are. Why is that? If they're running a hotel, why are they paying the same property tax we have? We're also on a private street. And again, we've had theft. We've never had so many burglaries on our neighborhood four in one night next to this house. And it's because we've got strangers coming all hours of the night into that neighborhood because of this house. So I oppose it. Thank you. Thank you for being brief. Your name Hi, address. I'm Terry O'Rourke. I live at 2000 Palm Canyon Court, and I am opposed to short-term rentals. Thank you, Terry. Thank you for your comments. Hi, I'm Hal Jones, 7811 Dana Point Court. I started out in the middle on this, trying to have an open mind. I moved towards uh, more regulation, and now I'm at the point where they ought to be banned. And I don't know how much you're aware, how much education you have, what's going on. Since I'm retired, I've actually spent quite a bit of time on this. More and more cities are banning or restricting them to private residences. One of the common issues across cities, and I see it in Las Vegas, is the ability to actually enforce the regulations. And so what I'd like to see is I'd like to see the Planning Commission and the City Council start working with the state to put some teeth into the fines. And the fines that apply to the platform operators who are allowing illegal activity, they ought to go against the host if they're mis uh, misbehaving. And I also think the guest. And other cities are starting to do this too, where they find the guest. So the people don't come in and disrupt neighborhoods because you know they're gonna get a big fine. Thank you. So uh, I, you know, I really think that's a key issue. Unless we can enforce these and, and have fines high enough, all this is a waste of time because people are laughing at the city right now because the number of illegal ones out there. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Thank you for your comments. Name and address for record. My name is Nita Dalat, uh, 2101 South Valadez Street, Las Vegas, 89117. Could you spell your last name for me? D A U L A T. Thank Dalat. you. I, s I very much oppose short term rentals in our neighborhood. Okay. Thank you, Nita. Thank you for your comments. Can you your name and address, please? My name is Helen Du. I live in 2187 South Valadez Street, 89117. I'm opposed to short term rental. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, right, Peter Fada, 2000 Diamond Bar Drive. Uh, the system is broken right now. It, there are no teeth in the enforcement division. They don't have enough people to uh, follow up with complaints. It's not working. Uh, everything else that's been said already and it's going to be said before it, I agree with. Thank you. Thank you for being brief. Can I get your name and address, please, for the record? Suzanne Emerson, 7801 Dana Point Court, and I strongly oppose for the same reasons mentioned before, especially by Hal and Chris Jones. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I'm Julie Christensen, <clears throat> 2000 Homeview Court. Uh, we oppose short-term rentals in our neighborhood. We have three. We've seen the problems that they cause. They become the responsibility of the neighbors to enforce, and that is a responsibility we should not have. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Name and address. My name is Diane Harrington. I live at 2020 Homeview Court. I oppose short-term rentals mainly because of the just listed idea that we as neighbors do not have time to monitor the situation and the problems that these bring into our neighborhoods. Thank you, Diane. Keith Thomas, 1561 Windhaven Circle in Ward 1. Um, I oppose uh, short-term rentals in residentially zoned areas. Uh, it's bad public policy. Just regulating bad public policy doesn't make it good public policy. So I oppose short-term rentals. Thank you. Hi. Hi, Carol Fada, 2000 Diamond Bar Drive. I am opposed to short-term rentals. Thank for you, Carol. all the reasons. Hi. Uh, thank you. Zan Heyer, 2001 Homeview Court. The short-term rentals are really a danger and a menace to our neighborhoods, and they're really impossible to effectively regulate, so I am opposed to them in any way. Thank you. Thank you. Tom Delio, 2231 Diamond Bar, 89117. Uh, I oppose. Thank you. Bob Meyer, 2030 Diamond Bar, 89117. I oppose. Thank you, Bob. Mary Ann Meyer, 2030 Diamond Bar Drive, 89117, and I am strongly opposed, and I don't think the city has the staff for the collection of violations. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for your comments. 
Hi, Paul and Kerry DiMattia at 1940 Ski Slope Circle, and we strongly oppose. Thank you. I'd like to take a minute here to just let you know, my wife and I were the ones that spearheaded this problem when it first occurred back in 2007, and it was because of this. When a tour bus full of volleyball players shows up and parks next door to my house, blocking my in driveway, cul in a cul-de-sac, that was the straw that broke the camel's back for us. So we oppose. So we strongly oppose, and we will fight this till the end. Thank you. Could you spell your last name for the record for me, please? Sure. It's D-E-M-A-T-T-I-A. -T Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. My name is Jurina Guerrero, G-A-R-E-T-T-O, 1500 Tim Palms Court, Las Vegas, 89117, and I strongly oppose short-term rentals. Thank you for coming up. Name and address, please, yes. for the record. Yes, uh, 8109 Via Del Cerro Court, 89117, Robert and Lorna Gordon. Gordon. And okay. we are in opposition. Thank you, Robert. Thank, Thank you. you. My name is Carol Heeren, H W -E, e R E N, 2105 South Buffalo Drive. We are a community of seven homes, currently two Airbnbs. Both live one beside me, one behind me. I have to call the police many times on them. Uh, there's a house right now while we're here, three doors down, so that would make three homes out of seven that are applying for Airbnbs. We have a lot of trouble with them parking, not taking garbage out. I have rats right now because of the one right next to me. I'm strongly, strongly opposed to this. Thank you for coming up. Hello again. My name is Jeff Belcher, um, 150 Las Vegas Boulevard, Unit 1713. Uh, regarding agenda item number nine, uh, I believe a recommendation for a banning of all STRs uh, throughout the city of Las Vegas. Of course, I strongly rec recommend and uh, agree with that. Um, I think uh, from a lot of research that our group has done, there are major cities across the United States that have set that precedent, um, actually uh, cities around the world. So I feel like uh, Las Vegas is a major player in, in, in the world. and and I believe that we should uh, be following a similar uh, band. Uh, the other agenda, item number 12, uh, I, I believe was obeyed, and it's regarding uh, creating a possible historic district. Uh, New Orleans just did this uh, with their French Quarter, uh, where they completely banned SDRs in that area. So I would, um, as a close second, I would uh, uh, recommend that. Okay, thank you. Thank Hi, Jonas Wolverton, the Ogden 150 Las Vegas Boulevard North. Um, I oppose SDRs, I call it the, uh, uh, agenda items number 9 and, and 12. I support those items, uh, total ban. Uh, looking at a historic district I think is very important, especially along Fremont East. And um, yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jonas. Name and address, please. Uh, Pamela Littleton, L-I-T-T-L-E-T-O-N, 7755 L Parque Avenue, 89117. Um, I'm in the neighborhood with Carol where we've got three out of seven homes we've been dealing with. And it seems to create a, uh, an environment where people are having a hard time selling their homes because they are there. And so it's affecting our, our property values. I've had them all day, all night, all week. People don't come, to, they come to Las Vegas to party. It's a bit different than most cities and the Airbnbs. And when a home is advertising that it's available for 20 people, but don't make any noise after 10, it's, it just isn't happening. And it's not like a homeowner where they'll have a party every now and then. It's seven days a week, and I mean, I couldn't turn the music up loud enough in my house to block the noise from the one right next to me. So I strongly oppose. Thank you for Thank your you comments. Thank you very much. Thanks. Steve Mandel, South Valley View, 4200 South Valley View. I noticed that about 90% of the people that just came up, they're all in the same building or the same yellow shirts for the same building, the same address, pretty close, Diamond Bar. Most of them said Diamond Bar, Diamond uh, Bar, Diamond Bar, Diamond Bar. Different houses, yeah. Yeah, but in the same area. I have a house in Summerlin. I also have um, a property on the Strip. And um, I'm, I'm for, I'm against it in the, uh, in the area where it's residential and stuff like that, but I've also noticed that a lot of people that stay for a year, you can't get them out and, and you know, have leases for a whole year and more. You can't get them out. They're just as bad as neighbors as the Airbnbs. They're not, you know, some of the Airbnbs are very good. We own, we own one, just, just one of them, and we notice it's, all our tenants are really good. They come from Verbo or Airbnb. They've all been good tenants. They've never wrecked our place. They never did any damages at all. It's a way that we make a living, you know, f a part of our living for that uh, supplemental income. And uh, I never had any problem with not one person 
that rented our place. Thank but you, I, Steve. I did have some people uh, uh, that come, they, they had these homeless people that around the neighborhood and they robbed my place. Uh, Steve, I gotta, I gotta wrap up the comments. So for clarity, you're for it. What's yeah. that? For clarity, you're for the having short-term rentals. I'm for it, I'm against it, like with as well houses and stuff like that, because you, you don't much. know who they are real fast, and you got a lot of little kids over there. Thank you. And the other areas where there's not residential, there's not many kids in that thing. Thank you for your comments. Thank you, Steve. My name is Sandra De Montano. I'm the broker for Avenue West Las Vegas at 400 South 4th Street, Suite 500, 89101, just a couple of blocks from here. Yep. I'm here to present a different option. Um, it's not either or, it's not three days or one year or two years. Um, we provide managed corporate housing services of, uh, in compliance with city regulations and HOA rules. Guest stays of 31 days or longer. These are legal. They're different caliber of clientele. I'm hoping the commission, it's not just me, it's not just Avenue West Las Vegas. There are other corporate housing providers that provide the same similar services. So I'm hoping that you provide as a commission that option and that education to the public. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, you Name and address, please, for the record. Good afternoon, Chairperson, uh, members of the Commission, Matthew Seibert, 630 South 4th Street, Las Vegas, Nevada, here to speak on behalf of short-term rentals. I uh, don't want to be redundant, but I'd like to echo the comments made by uh, my colleague Nathan Taylor. Um, the way to solve this problem isn't to uh, completely outlaw things, it's to regulate them, and that way the city will have the authority and, and, and know who's you know, operating short-term rentals, and if there's a problem, they have the uh, the the regulations in place so they can, you know, address those problems and take out the bad actors. And uh, with that, I would just like to again say we support short-term rentals and we are against prohibiting them. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. James Barlow, 1304 East Oakey Boulevard. I'm in favor of short-term rentals, provided they're properly regulated. I know we have a lot of laws that are currently on the books and things in the code, but as so many people have said, uh, the city lacks the teeth to enforce those. I think of, I would like to live in a city where it would be say easier for someone to get a license, but with those licenses comes a lot of revenue into the city, which would give the city enough money to hire people to enforce those codes, and then that way someone who currently, when we have thousands of unlicensed short-term rentals in the city, if they were licensed, it would be much easier if the city had the teeth to go and yank those licenses from someone and give those people doing short-term rentals a financial incentive to not allow bad actors in their house, not allow a tour bus full of volleyball people to stay there because they will get their license yanked. So I am in favor of short-term rentals. Thank you. Thank you, James. Hi, David Figler, 1302 South 6th Street. Uh, I, I know that the commission is well aware uh, over the many months and now years of hearing these policy concerns, uh, some which kind of get lost in the haze that short-term rentals as an experiment uh, reduce the stock of affordable housing, which is important for our city and its growth, uh, take away the quiet enjoyment of neighborhoods and take away neighborhood watch eyes and things of this nature. I know you know all these things. The experiment that the city is engaged upon, really uh, the, the brunt of that is borne by wards one and three. Um, and as such, we have made an uh, offer to uh, uh, Planning Commissioner Summerfield, uh, and, and that offer is standing, uh, to deal with a lot of the nuance of these uh, uh, proposed text amendments. There are a lot of nuance there. Uh, if very briefly, what I wanted to talk about is that there are, are s the, the, the comments made about how the neighbors are de facto becoming deputies to have to do enforcement uh, is a huge issue. Um, it is a burden that we didn't ask for that comes to us, and so perhaps one of of the uh, minimum threshold requirements that could be considered by the commission is that there has to be a sign off from all houses within like say a 50 foot uh, distance from it before it even gets to you so that we don't have to keep coming as neighbors back to commission meetings that go over and over and over and then for this new trend where and I don't know if you're aware of this uh, chairman Cherry, that the uh, the council is overruling you even on variances with 660s lately uh, it's been happening and so now instead of just asking us to come to commission meetings that last six seven eight hours now in the middle of the day to go to city council meeting to uh, uh, 
give the same concerns. Last point, um, there is this nuance of, uh, and a new trend of something called owner-occupied. Uh, these type of uh, compelling arguments that are being made to both the commission and the, and the city council uh, are, are not well-defined in any of the proposed text amendments to the extent where enforceability can occur or where verifiability can occur. It's almost like if you talismanically say this is owner-occupied, that it certainly it now puts you into a different level. The last comment I want to make is I want to give kudos, and because I rarely have the ability to say, um, code enforcement is doing an outstanding job of uh, adjusting to the new demand. They uh, have made adjustments, they have changed companies, they are coming out and doing what they're supposed to do to assess though the rules do prevent them from making all the determinations that they necessarily need to do to give you good information and to give um, planning and uh, business licensing especially good information. It's really hard. So my suggestion is instead of allowing a proliferation of this experiment, especially as it's weighing very heavily on the historic districts and one and th Ward 3, um, that we look for narrowing or ending additional until that type of adjustment that business licensing is, is actually doing a good job of catches up with the existing stock. So if it's not an absolute ban, that's certainly a, a consideration of moratoriums so that c enforcement can catch up. Um, with what's actually happening out there in our neighborhoods would be very valid, but I think ultimately that if you are going to consider text amendments or if you are going to consider new regulations or enforceable regulations, you have to include the citizens impacted because we have all the good ideas and we know exactly what the practical input is. So uh, reach out, uh, Mr. Summerfield. It's, it's a standing offer and we've got so many folks who are very smart about this. Thank you, Mr. Figler. Thank, thank you. you. Please, folks, please. Thank you. Gene Raper, 1717 Tangiers Drive. I'm here to speak in favor of short-term rentals, regulated short-term rentals, if you will. Um, I would start simply by saying prohibitions don't work. We've learned that through history, if anything, in our civilization. Prohibitions don't work. You cut them off, everybody's illegal. Most of the people here, the people that they are talking about are either unlicensed, don't have their special use permit, they're illegal to start with. They aren't being regulated at this point. The real problem is regulation. The process that was set up a year ago with the ordinance, I think is a sound one. It puts regulations and controls and covers most of the complaints that you've heard. When the citizens show up, they have the opportunity to speak about what goes on in their neighborhood. I think that's great, and it should be that way. But if you outlaw them, you have no way to control them. The real concentration should be how do we fund enforcing this. That's the problem, as I see it. When you make them legal, those that pass the test, and there should be a test, there should be a process, and it should be difficult, those people will start paying taxes. Those that are illegal are not paying the taxes. That is a great revenue source for enforcement. Thank, thank you, thank Mr. Ripper. Thank you for your comments. And, and thank you for everybody in the audience for coming up and being brief. And oh, we have one more person. Uh, thank you for being brief and to the point on everything and not being redundant. Uh, that, that certainly helped out a lot, and uh, for the people that had additional comments, I know some of them I let talk a little more, but it's just comments that I think help this commission understand where things are going and, and how to address them. Uh, Commissioner Slotman? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I'm not going to speak on this because it's not uh, correct for me to speak on it at, at this time, but I just want to, uh, through you, just let everybody know that all the comments that were, were stated tonight will be put into the record, and this is uh, held over till next month. So all the comments that, that, that was stated tonight will, will be on record for us to review next month, and we'll be able to uh, listen to that. So if you can't make it down next month, your comments are still heard. Thank you. And, and for a little clarity, the request is till October 9th on the, uh, on the abeyance. Uh, yeah, so for clarity, but it, like, as Commissioner Schlotman said, it will be part of the record that we have to review. So uh, again, thank you. And moving on uh, for a motion on the housekeeping items with Vice Chair Quinn. Uh, thank you, Commissioner, uh, I mean, Chairman Cherry. Um, staff recommends that um, item nine be moved to the October 9th uh, Planning Commission meeting and number 12 to be moved to the um, October I'm sorry, the October 9th meeting. So with that, my motion is for approval. Uh, is it motion for, should be for abeyance until then. For abeyance. Oh, I'm sorry, for abeyance. Thank you, Vice Chair. There's a motion on the floor. Please cast your vote.
Thank you. Thank you. That motion carries. Uh, we will be moving on to the consent items. Consent items are considered routine by the Planning Commission and may be enacted by one motion. However, any item may be discussed if a commission member applicant so desires. Um, I will note on item number seven of the consent agenda, I will be abstaining. My company is working with uh, uh, looking at a project with one of the principals in another city, so I will be abstaining. A motion on the consent items. Thank you. Moving on to the consent items. Um, number six, TMP 7386, and number seven, TMP 7384. Um, My motion is for approval on these two items. So motion on the floor, please cast your vote. That motion carries. Mr. Chairman, those items are final action this evening unless appealed to the city clerk's office within seven days. Thank you. Moving on to the director's business, item number eight, abeyance item TXT 73545, applicant owner, city of Las Vegas, for possible action request to amend LVMC Title 19, Uni Unified Development Code of the city of Las Vegas, to introduce LVMC 1909, form-based code, and to provide for other related matters. Staff recommends approval. Can we get the staff report, or we'll have a presentation, excuse me. Good afternoon, uh, Michael Howe, City of Las Vegas Planning Department, 333 North Rancho Drive. Uh, with me I have Lorenzo Mastino, my coworker. Um, apologies in advance, I'm gonna speak really quickly because I made assurances that this would be a 10 minute or less uh, status update, five minute or less. Um, saving us time for some discussion and questions. So real quickly, <laughs> Um, timeline from where we're at, again, we, stopped the, we started this process two years ago last summer with the adoption of the downtown master plan. Uh, we picked up the consulting firm Lisa Wise to begin work on the form-based code back in May of 2017. Um, real quickly, we had a draft of the public review draft of the form-based code available since November of 2017. And for that period between November 2017 right up until August 6th, literally, um, we've had that draft open for public comment. Um, we're now at the stage where we're introducing the Title 1909 chapter of the new Unified Development Code. Um, community involvement, really a crucial component to this whole process. Again, I want to emphasize that we've had almost over a year process of outreach through uh, four neighborhood meetings, five downtown community events, three months of uh, form-based code open house at the Development Services Center, um, briefings with planning commissioners, city council members, stakeholders, uh, three form based code institute, uh, full day training sessions, and again, 10 months of public comment period beginning back since November. Um, again, the key component why are we doing a form based code? Going back to that process of the downtown master plan that was adopted in summer of uh, 2016, the number one policy initiative that was emphasized to take effect was adopt a form-based code for multiple reasons. Um, some of the key components are it's a good policy to put in place that neighbors know what development is coming, developers know what the process is in advance for streamlined quicker entitlements. Um, it's a good way of establishing the character and nature of a neighborhood. It's good for neighborhood preservation. So again, multiple components to this process is what led us to make this the first primary focus on implementing the downtown master plan. Next steps, uh, as you can see, August 14th, where we're at right now at this moment, looking for that recommendation for the adoption of, again, the Title 1909 Form Based Code, a chapter of the Unified Development Code. Uh, the next step would be, with approval of this recommendation, going to the September 5th City Council and then a very important key component that I want to stress, October 9th, we'd be looking at taking that general plan amendment, a land use amendment, to get that first step into mapping and rezoning the land so that it becomes applicable to the form-based code. Um, again, then October 17th, we would have the development code portion adopted by city council. And November 13th, we would take that rezoning action. So the key components we have to understand is Adoption of, the de of this development code does not exercise the code itself. We still have to go through the process of doing the land use amendment and the rezoning. So all properties affected by law will be notified. We'll have neighborhood meetings explaining the process, what these zoning districts are, how they came about, and how the code applies. Ultimately, 
this code would take effect if, if everything goes according to plan by December 19th. So even though we, we'd be looking for adoption by this evening, we still have a land use amendment process and a rezoning process and a multiple steps of adoption through council before the code takes effect. So the soonest it would take effect is again December 19th. So assuming that we do have adoption after December 19th, what we're looking at internally, how to handle this process, because it is a substantially new code, um, we will monitor and maintain the form-based code through a process internally so that when we're making um, notes and comments and we're, we're seeing how the code's applied and how it works, we have this ability to revisit the code every six months. So on a biannual basis, if the code's going in the right direction, that's good, but if there's a little tweaks and tune-ups and things that aren't going right, we'll have a very predictable process so that the community can see at what point in time the code's going through an amendment to update or make corrections if, if areas weren't addressed correctly. Um, we'll also have a planning review and applicants form-based code support team. So again, since this initial effort is really a, a pilot development code for the Las Vegas Medical District, we have the capacity with staff right now that we can take projects, you know, case by case as they come in and walk them through the code and, and have them understand pretty much the flexibility. I think there's a lot of misunderstandings that when you see the code, there's, you know, it says exactly what we want. But there's, there's areas where the developer and an architect can work and basically use design to solve a lot of the, the, the issues more so than what the typical land use code that we have in place right now. And then in this process, what we also have is it's the publicly available, what we call you know, full transparency of how this code works. So if, again, if we're seeing an issue come up, and we have to make interpretations and it hits to the point where we need to change the code, um, the whole process will be open so that any stakeholder, developer, and neighbor will have the ability of seeing on a timely basis when the code's being opened back up to make those fine tunings, the, you know, the, the, the quick corrections. And with that, um, we do have the draft code. It, it is available online, formbasecode.vegas. Uh, the full draft has been there in place for the past 10 months. So with that, I can take uh, questions from planning commissioners or the public. Thank you. Uh, this was noticed as a public hearing. I'll, I'll open it up to the public if there's any public Chairman comment. Chairman Cherry. Oh, excuse me. I apologize. I tried to jump in earlier and I was unable I to. Apologize. I will need to abstain from this item. As I've previously disclosed and as I always will, I own property in the medical district and in downtown Las Vegas in the arts district, which is part of the redevelopment area as well and also part of the downtown area where this code would be enacted. And so in an abundance of caution, I'm going to be abstaining and recuse myself from the meeting. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I do own uh, a house in, in, in the downtown area and a bar, but um, it's not going to affect me greater or lesser than anyone else and won't affect my independence of judgment, so I will be voting on this matter. Thank you, Commissioner. And uh, to keep the disclosures going, I have the same, uh, I have properties in the downtown area. However, I, I don't feel it affects me one way or the other, and we'll be able to uh, vote on the item today. So. With that, I will open up to the public. Can you get your name and address for the record, please? Chairman Cherry, Justin Michaels, 820 Rancho Lane, uh, 89106. Our office is actually located in the medical district. Uh, my, I guess, point of concern is uh, for the past year, uh, we have been meeting with the city regarding property that we own on the south side of Charleston. And continually, we have been told, please be patient, please be patient. We are going to have a form-based code. So much so that this past April, uh, an item of ours for 2001 West Charleston was remanded back to the Planning Commission. We completely scrapped our original plan, and as of three weeks ago, I had a new plan which would meet with what you intend to do with the form-based code. Two-story building up against the street, right? What the city would like to see, activated sidewalks, ground floor retail. I am now informed that this will not be the case because the south side of Charleston will not be included in the new form-based code. And uh, to say that I'm gravely concerned that I've now spent tens of thousands of dollars between architects, engineers, uh, traffic studies, uh, repotting, plotting parcels, and numerous other things to then suddenly kind of have the rug pulled out from under, underneath of us at the last minute, uh, I would venture to say is a bit unfair. And, you know, I can't do anything with my property because I'm being told, well, the old co code 
isn't really applicable because we have the new form based code. And so now I plan for a new form based code, and here I am going to do everything that I'm asked to do, and suddenly the new form based code won't be applicable to my property. So is it inverse condemnation? Because I've just spent over a year not being able to do anything because we don't have a well defined plan. And that is very hard to buy property and make the appropriate investments through tenant improvements, uh, constructing new con uh, buildings, spending time with lenders and the myriad of other things that you are all very familiar with in this process to then suddenly have the finish line changed again. So I ask that you take into consideration to please include the south side of Charleston as part of this uh, form-based code. Until very recently, I'd always been under the, and I hate to say it, assumption that it would be included because everything that I have, the form-based code includes all the way back to approximately Ellis on uh, the south side of Charleston. So. Th thank you. Uh, thank you for your comments. Anyone else like to come up and speak? How you doing, Judge? Can I get your name and address for the record, please? Sir, ladies and gentlemen. It's the first time I've appeared before this body. Donald Mosley, 1127 Westland Drive. I don't mean to be unkind, but I think the plain department is trying to extricate and eliminate homeowners' input on these zoning questions. I don't, think, I don't know who they think they're fooling, but I and my neighbors are not fooled, and more and more all the time are becoming conversant with what's going on here. This is purely wrong. It does not allow homeowners to have input in the way that they have done traditionally and should continue to do. And here's how they're going about it. They're creating a matrix in a given geographical area. They're listing all these things that are allowed Developer comes in, tailors their project to fit the matrix, and it's a done deal. The neighbors hear about it when they see the 15-story building going up. The neighbors have no input as they had traditionally, and such things as traffic, traffic uh, uh, problems that uh, some uh, pro uh, one project might create, uh, lack of light and air coming to your home because you've got some monolith in your backyard. Uh, such things as uh, noise that uh, associated with many of these projects. All the things that traditionally people, citizens, came here to discuss is going to be eliminated. And they're just going to do it. It is wrong. Now, I understand that they wanted to do this citywide initially. And now they've seen some opposition and they want to tailor it to the medical district. But this is just the first step. Six months from now, they're going to want to include the various wards, and it's going to be a done deal. This is wrong. It's convenient. I know it's a nuisance to listen to all these neighbors coming up here and talking, but I'm sorry, it's the American way. I'd ask you to reject it. Thank you, Thank you Your Honor. Can you get your name and address for the record, please? Sure. Uh, my name is Scott Becker, 10723 Myrtle Grove Avenue, 89166. And I'm here today representing United Health Group, which is a company that is developing the property on the corner of Rancho and Charleston. Uh, it's a $20 million investment into an integrated cancer center. Uh, UHG has been in that building for several years and will be in there for several more years as they make this investment. And um, I appreciate the efforts of uh, the, the planning department and uh, I've been in on some of the meetings that they have presented and it's a tremendous amount of work that they've done. Um, my concern is that um, with all due respect to the citizens and the residents input, the property that we're developing on the west side of Rancho <coughs> and the, the north side of Charleston, 2300, um, is not buffered in any way by residential properties. And the last map that uh, Lorenzo shared with me showed that um, in addition to the properties on Charleston, which uh, do abut the residential properties, our property was taken off of the pilot program 
And um, we would like to see that put back in that program because we are bordered by all commercial properties and we'd like to be a part of that first part of the program. We'd like to participate. Thank you, Mr. Becker. Thanks Thank for, you the for your comments. Uh, seeing no other comments, uh, Mr. Truesdale, with one more person. Thank you. Um, as uh, Mr. Howell represented, that. I need your name and address. Oh, sure. Rick Thanks. Truesdale, 820 South Rancho Lane. Thanks. Uh, they've been working on this for roughly two years. Prior to that point in time, as far back as when Margot Wheeler was director of planning, they had set up a panel to meet with all the property owners in the downtown to go over a foreign-based code. Um, I think uh, uh, Mr. the director Summer. would has remember, I see right in front of your name, I can't see it, no. But the director does remember those meetings when they started out. Uh, the city has spent countless hundreds of thousands of dollars going through this process. Uh, city Council brought in a consultant to speak about planning and the first words out of his mouth were is, if I were you, I wouldn't do the foreign based code at all. It's a bad thing. Uh, staff's been working through foreign based code and it seems like every time we hit a r bump in the road or a little bit of pushback, we'll just take those few houses or that, that little property out of it or not out of it. But all the time saying, well, we're, we're gonna slow down projects until we get this code together. It's been a phenomenal expense, not to myself only, uh, the church, which we were told, oh, they, we met with all the neighbors and got them on board for approval of zoning under that, and the council's office asked us to wait for the form-based code and the council's assistant. Uh, we get feedback from staff, oh no, this is okay, but under the form-based code, you'll be able to do this. We spend another 20000 on architectural fees for two projects, the church piece and a piece that we finally got zoned uh, master plan office to at least put it under one entitlement. And now it seems like the latest wrinkle of the day is let's take out south of Charleston. I understand Judge Mosley's concerns, um, but for us that have worked on this and and have worked with every one of those homeowners in Scotch 80s and most of the ones in McNeil to, to address their concerns, no matter which way the code goes, it's, it's pretty ridiculous that we would have gone this far into this and now oh, we'll just take the south side of Charleston off, which I'm not sure if that means suddenly we're gonna go back to the sawtooth of property ownership along Charleston. Is that the case if it's taken out? So to clarify, it's what you'll have is that the form based code will not yeah. be applicable. It may, may be best to get all the comp the, yeah, all the we'll, comments. We'll go through the, the comments now. and then we'll okay. start asking okay. questions. Okay, we've, we've been working with the city under the assumption that, or, and the direction that it would go back to Ellis. If you say it's no longer a part of the, uh, the medical district form code, that means all the master planning, all the other stuff will be this jigsaw of a bunch of non-usable parcels. It, it's good for about 60 days for the homeowners. It's bad for a lifetime for the city and the homeowners because it means every developer is going to be back here with whittling away at every little piece of property rather than bringing a project of significance to deal with the property and deal with global issues with this. This, this whole process has come a, a little apart and excuse my words because they may be a little harsher, a little more pushback. Uh, lack of fair dealing on the city's part through this process. And I've been to every, almost every meeting, I would, staff will tell you, and participated in a, in a positive and sometimes negative manner. Um, I appeared at the request of Director uh, Perigo to meet with the city council and talk about, while this process was going on, to be consistent about zoning. If you're, if you're gonna go through this process and you think this form-based code is your end, work with the, the property owners to that end. That has not been the case because between staff and the council's office and the homeowner's feedback and uh, liaison's feedback, everybody's getting a mixed story. What I can tell you what is absolutely not a mixed story is the reduced area of the medical district that seems to be part of the form-based code 
includes a lot of property owned by UMC, properties purchased by the city of Las Vegas through various partnerships, and the university. University has no control, no matter old code, new code. They can build whatever they want without calling a neighbor, without even talking to anybody. They just show up with a plan, it gets approved, whether it's 60 stories or six stories. We agreed to height restrictions on the south side of Charleston so the neighbors would know what they could expect and traffic issues and all of those things. Why all that effort was uh, encouraged on behalf of property owners and developers to, to spend time and, and interact with you, to have it thrown out because you got a little pushback seems pretty weak need government if you ask me. You know, we need good government, we need strong government, but we need a medical district that can stand the time. Right now, with the reduced medical district where the city has bought land at outrageous prices, uh, various pieces of parcels, and they're the highest density zoning under this form-based code, but all the property that is miscellaneous, C1, office, et cetera, on the south side, may not even be developable at all if you go with this jigsaw of the old parcel lines, which city council voted not to. They voted to go with a facility plan back in December of 2015 that spelled this out. Uh, this is why somebody needs to make a real decision and leaving out the south side of Charleston to Ellis is a grand mistake. It makes the form-based code a fiasco. All right, Mr. And Jesus, we'll have to wrap up. I know, I'm, I'm just, I've got to pull this on here because I do plan to come back and make I, more I arguments and, yep. and I have legitimate concerns as the city attorney knows that you're gonna have a form-based code that takes care of the medical district, which means things can happen there. The city can build its garage if they decide to do it or don't do it because I just looked at the master planning for UMC and their garage isn't so steady. Just like the medical school, based on some comments from the city, got very unsteady for a period of time. But you need a medical district in this community, a world-class medical district, and with the land you were gonna put in this reduced code is a failure from the day it starts. And now, you, and if you pass this, the next thing you're gonna do is you wanna take this down to the arts district. I own land in the arts district. I know uh, Commissioner Rouse does and others on this board. The fact is, if this code is, you go to the arts district and get pushed back on one or two things, right, you're going to pull I, it away. I have to, ask so I have to wrap this up. If you're going to pass it, pass it completely, if you're not it, or not at all. Okay, thank you for your comments. $300,000 was wasted on this program. The, one of the groups, one of the consultants. Mr. Trusdale, I have to wrap up the comments. One of the consultants that worked on it in, from the city of Flagstaff <laughs> actually left the city and works on this, thank this you. code. The city of Flagstaff is now going to with, uh, remove that code from their books. Okay. So think about those. Th things. Thank you for your comments. Anyone else from the public like to be heard in this? Okay, seeing so no one else, we're gonna turn it back over to the city. Let me just clarify. Yep, and the director would like to uh, clarify a few things. So, Mr. Chairman, I just want to clarify a couple of the comments so that we're sure what you are acting on today. So, the item that's before the the commission today is the regulating, or it's not the regulating plan. A lot of the conversation you heard um, is about the regulating plan. The regulating plan has shrunk to uh, encompass just the core medical district or the area that was formerly just the medical district uh, and then the, the corridor of the medical district that goes up uh, Martin Luther King Boulevard up to the 95. The area on the south side of Charleston and on the west side of Rancho stays in the medical district. The, the updated um, pilot uh, regulating plan will not change that those are areas of the medical district. They will just not be in the uh, first um, iteration of the regulating plan when that comes through. What you have before you tonight or this afternoon is the, the base code, the base development standards that will, would apply under this form-based code approach. 
So there's still work to do, as, as Mike mentioned during his uh, brief presentation, the regulating plan will come forward as a part of that general plan amendment and that rezoning action that will be coming in future months. Um, but the, and part of the reason why we're piloting that is because there was a lot of uh, questions about will this work here? And so that's why the footprint of the regulating plan has, uh, has shrunk, working with both uh, Council Mayor Pro Tem's office and Councilman Creer's office on, on how that might be deployed. But those are future questions. Tonight is just are the development standards that have been proposed and reviewed over uh, the last many months, um, do we think that those are appropriate standards for our base uh, introductory form-based code that will then come back with uh, tr uh, the adoption of a regulating plan through the general plan and zoning process. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, before I, I turn it over, uh, I just had a couple comments. It, maybe you could quickly tell us, briefly tell us, I, I know it's been a long process, gone back years, but uh, what's changed through public comment to get us th through our point today? Uh, you know, for example, uh, you know, I remember this was part before it was a pilot program, I understand why it's a pilot program at the moment. Uh, th it had the south side of Charleston. And I do remember it had, uh, before a form-based code, I, I think I want to say you could go up to eight stories on some things as the way the current code was sitting. But the form-based code actually reduced that and then still maintained uh, residential adjacency, still maintained parking. Uh, you know, we can never guarantee light coming through because uh, unless there's air rights that are purchased, but um, so, so it seems like it's been reduced because it, there's still some some process to go through on the south side of Charleston to get there. But I guess my point is, it sound, from what I was hearing, it was a, a good plan that was put forward of on the south side um, based on the fact you still had the adjacencies, based on the fact that it seemed like you restricted uh, and made more in line with what the, the medical district was going to be, um, but they're not all two-story buildings. It might have been, uh, you can clear it up, five or six stories, I think, was the cap that was on there. Uh, is, was that correct? Uh, well, Mr. Chairman, to, to clarify, the, the eight stories was more or less a rule of thumb. So it was agreed on, but it wasn't written into code. So okay. with, with the zoning, you could actually go higher. Um, but to revisit the, the issue with the property south of Charleston and um, west of Rancho, because we're, we're coming out of the gate with a substantially new code that's fairly complex. We try to make it as, as easy to understand through the process of having staff available to actually meet with developers. So in this case, with those properties, we were having what I feel, in my opinion, a, a fairly good plan, a good discussion. But with a new plan like this, out the gate, not having full rock solid consensus, we felt let's just really focus on the projects that we know are coming in the core medical district demonstrate that there's some viability here and basically prove that this, the process is viable and let it grow on its own. And, and so it's, and I understand that's why it's being called a, a pilot program. And I, I listen, I'm 100% I'm behind the medical district. I think it's gonna be, uh, you know, shiny penny in the valley. It's gonna be something that's, that's really special. Um, but we, we don't wanna have something that's broken either, you know, and so uh, again, I'm, I'm I've been fine with the way it sits. What happens if an applicant comes today with their project on that south portion of Charleston? Uh, I mean, they can just go through the process like a project would sit in the existing code. Is that correct? Correct. And, and to clarify, they're still within the medical district overlay. So they're still in the medical district. They won't have an applicable form-based code. What will apply is the interim development standards that we wrote, kind of that, the 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 interim code and what happens is on a case-by-case -case basis you have to review each project on its merits what happens is title 19 applies and title 19 doesn't fit very well on this stretch of road so the process of development still moves it still occurs um, what you'll see is that there'll be more entitlement requirements for waivers um, possible variances and exceptions as opposed to the form-based code that allows it to go through more right, it takes the vision of the medical district and codifies but, it but even with um, you know because there, there's a feeling that someone can come forward and just do whatever they want there's still again residential adjacency there's still parking requirements correct correct there, there's, there's still, still use regulation and within the code you do get the picture of what's coming there should never be a surprise 
because again, you have all the parameters laid out on the code, what that zoning district is. So by using the code, you pretty much get a good understanding of what development is coming. Okay, uh, Vice Chair Quinn. Thank you, through you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my first question is, um, when you have an applicant that has applied numerous times for previous codes um, for, the for, for the, his projects, and then the form-based code changes, does that applicant's money move over to the next application, or is he just out of the money because it, the form-based code has changed? So my question is to you, uh, Director Summerfield, does, is his money just lost, or is it moved into the next application process? Mr. Chairman, through you, so Vice Chair, I apologize, I want to make sure I understood. So your concern is if someone has an application in progress and the code changes, um, do they lose their original application or do they? So the way it works is, um, and the city attorney can weigh in it uh, if I say something uh, off here, but the way it works under the, the application process, you submit your application based on the code that is in effect at the time of your application. The council and the commission are supposed to weigh that project based on the code and the law that was effective when the application came through. And so they get to have their project reviewed based on the code that was applicable when they submitted their application. If the code changes in the interim, then those code changes do not uh, automatically or necessarily apply to that project. Now there are some caveats in there if, if some weird stuff happened when the law was enacted, but generally speaking, an application is heard based on the code that was uh, in effect when the application was submitted. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, my next question is, um, this week there was a miscommunication and I was not included in the chairman's briefing. So I'd like to know um, if it's correct that under T5, um, which is the medical district, um, is this inclusive that an auto repair garage, a minor, a major, building and landscape materials, building maintenance, shop and storage yard, um, plant nursery, um, equipment sales or rent, light um, uh, fabrication, manufacturing, uh, post office facility, warehouse, distribution center, welding repair, a showroom for the welding, and also that um, if they're storing any removable toxic sub substances and waste, pollution and flammable liquids, I could go on and on. So are these, um, are these, applications in the medical district as in T5. So in other words, when I'm sitting at Starbucks and I look across the street, am I going to be looking at a garage per se with cars being fixed or am I going to be looking at what the mayor pro temp has worked diligently on which is a medical district that has nothing to do with any of these um, uses, in my opinion, under her vision. So, Mr. Chairman, through you, if I could answer this real quickly. Without getting into the specifics of all those uses, the core component to remember how a form-based code is, the last stage, the last step of applicable code is the use. So if we were to take, for instance, a concern about a garage on a T5 zoning district on Rancho, well, for the T5, it has to meet the development standards. So we're starting to get in the shape, the size, and the location of the building. So if you're picturing a garage, it's not going to apply if, per the development code, it really requires that street frontage. You know, the garage use could possibly work if they can figure out how to fit it in that 2,000 square foot building 
but still having all the walkability, all the frontages along the street, all the uses basically contained within the structure. So, so, you, so use uh, is the last stage of development coordination. So, so through you, Mr. Chairman, the answer is that these uses can be put in the medical district. Through you, Mr. Chair, could I clarify something on this? Yes. Commissioner? Yeah. Uh, those uses that you just mentioned, uh, those are only allowed in the T5 uh, employment zone, uh, what we call employment zone or mix, uh, mixed industrial. Uh, and that would be in the very north, uh, northeast portion of the medical district that is uh, the, the expansion area that is currently zoned industrial already. So the answer is yes. With a lot of, yes. oh, sorry. Okay. C can I get your name and address for the record, please, um, Lorenzo? Lorenzo Massino, uh, Long Range Planning. Thank you. Okay, so I won't um, make this meeting any longer than I have to. So with that, I will not be supporting this as it's written this evening because this certainly is not the vision that I foresaw. So. You will not get my support on this this evening. Thank you. Commissioner, if I may, and again, to try to clarify that point, there's multiple safety levels to prevent, I think, what you're, the condition that you're concerned with. So that T5 zoning district is going to have multiple sub-zoning districts. So in this case, for the, the medical district, the core area, those few areas where we have the T5 and there's more preponderance of T6, again, the first level is you have a district level control of uses. So in this case for the medical district, if we wanted to limit blood plasma centers to only T6 hospital uses, we can do that. And we've, we've done that in response to neighbors' concerns. So regarding the larger industrial level uses that you find for a certain district, again, the primary concern is do you get the shape, the lot coverage, the building size, and all the uses to fit correctly? and then the uses follow. So for the most part, it's not a, a floodgate to get garages and more industrial uses within the medical district because, again, they won't economically or feasibly fit. Because if the code's been written to really support more of the medical uses and office uses, research and development uses, we're not going to get the garages. We're not prohibiting a garage or a tow yard or those types of activities if they fit into those unique, specific zoning districts. But again, they have to fit into the form. So it's with a, I can't say it's a, a black and white, will certain uses not be eliminated, but feasibly they won't be allowed. And, and maybe one more question to this. If, let's say um, it's, it's not allowed, it doesn't fit, a person can still come forward with an application for a waiver to get to a special use permit or some type of variance, I guess, to have a use no matter what T zone uh, they're applying in. Is that correct? To go through the, the public hearing process. To they, they can still go through the public to hearing process. Council. So even if this didn't allow it, there would still be a process uh, for them to come forward to the bodies to get. Uh, and that would entertain the, the public hearing process where then all neighbors are notified. I just one last comment to you, um, Chairman Chairing. Um, my opinion is they shouldn't even be an option. So with that, I will not be supporting this this evening. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Schlaubin? Yes, uh, Chairman. I, I put all my comments on the record last month. I'll just make it brief. I do like, I mean, I, I, I was there with Commissioner Truesdale from the very beginning years ago when we were sitting down the, what is it, the Fifth Street School, and um, at, at the very beginning, and it was frustrating because it was hard to understand what this form-based code was. As it went to more APA, con uh, um, you know, um, conferences, and we went to the APA State Conference, and um, you know, y'all were up there presenting the the good good things about the code, and I was there to present like all the holes in the code, to uh, so y'all could figure out what y'all needed to plug and figure out. Um, after this uh, past month, I had a chance to sit down with uh, the two planners that's sitting up here today, and I said, okay, we've been looking at this for the past three, four years, however long it's been, maybe even longer. I said, okay, tell me how to develop a project. And they said, 
okay, well, where, where's the project? And I just pointed out a map and I said, hey, this parcel right here. And they took me through the whole process. And I think it, it's gonna be a learning curve. And anytime we, you know, take a code and we change our code, it's like moving to a whole new city like it was 14 or 15 years ago when I moved here and I had to relearn the, the entire process. But if everything works out, the way that the code works out, which it, you know, never works out 100% the way we want. Um, I mean, with the with 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 the pedestrian pathways and the the mid block crosswalks and the the uh, trees, benches, this and that. A lot of which was within the downtown Centennial plan at one point. Uh, but I think this further, um, you know, puts everything in perspective between the buildings and and the actual pedestrian-like pathways, and I am a little bit disappointed that, uh, that uh, you know, we took off the south side of the, the uh, Charleston because I wasn't aware of that until this, uh, till this meeting, so, um, you know, I, I could support this with a recommendation to city council that they add the south side, or I could go with the, um, you know, a, a denial with the recommendation that it goes forward to, you know, um, or that they, they add back in the south side in Charleston. But whatever it is, I, I think we need to kick off the form-based code. We spend enough time and money, let's see how it works. And then, but uh, my recommendation would be, you know, um, you know, rec you know uh, for city staff to tell city council that it was at least my recommendation that we add back in that south side. Thank you, Commissioner. I have one more thing before I go to Commissioner DeSalvio. Um, is, is there a way to harden up the or uh, make it more restrictive to remove the uses completely that Vice Chair was talking about and still have Absolutely. the, the form-based code? Absolutely. At a district level. So you can even have, so there's always been concerns with the variations that the arts districts, not the medical districts, not the Fremont district. So one of the first, it's kind of a scale or plan. Mm -hmm. The first step is what unique uses are specific to a district and you can then begin to tailor to that level. Uh, so okay, with so the medical when you district, say at the district level, what does that mean? Exactly? So in this case with the medical district, um, I'm not aware of a T5 zoning district that allows a tow yard, but you could easily say tow yards within the medical district are a prohibited use. Okay, and, and, and again, uh, to echo uh, Vice Chair's comment, I mean, there, there's a vision for this area, and it seems like this could have been brought forward to us with those restrictions at that point. And, and, and I can see how you looked at it and said, well, it's form-based and it wouldn't fit in the box uh, that easily, but there's still a chance it could in some way, maybe, I don't know, and, and maybe not. But it just seems like it, if people understood it was an automatic no uh, for this area on those specific uses, um, it would kind of help the vision push it along a little further and faster. And I, again, I will echo Commissioner Schlotman's comments about, you know, we're recommending body to the city council, and I would, I would uh, if there was a way to find the South Charleston portion to work, because I, I will say just based on briefings I had in the past that, uh, again, I go back to what I saw with residential adjacency and parking and what was, what I thought was lower height limits as opposed to uh, what people could go for. I was, I felt like it was going down the right path, so. But, Commissioner DeSalvio? I, I concur totally to echo what he said. Uh, you know, uh, Judge uh, Mosley, <clears throat> spot on, taking the, 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 the resident's voice out of it, to me, is a huge concern. Uh, Mr. Truesdale carving out the south side. I just think it needs to be massaged a little bit more for me to get behind it and support it. I just, I want to see it come to fruition. I'm not one. Anybody knows me. I don't like kicking the can down the road for nobody. But I'm just telling you right now, I think it needs, a, for me to support it, it needs a little bit more work. Taking the voice of the people out, saying that this is a one size fits all for me, I have a problem with that. So for that, I can't support it tonight. Uh, okay. Um, is there, thank you, Commissioner Savio. Commissioner Quinn? Did you Vice want Quinn? a motion? Yeah, I, I, if there's no further discussion, uh, I'd, li I'd like um, to hear a motion to, so we can keep moving along. Um, thank you. Regarding uh, advance item number 8, TXT, 
73545. Um, My motion is to not um, follow staff's recommendation this evening. My motion is for denial. There's a motion on the floor, please cast your vote. There's a, that motion carries. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Chairman, that item will move forward to city council in ordinance form for their consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, commissioners. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, moving on to item number 10. Tax Amendment 73931, applicant owner, City of Las Vegas, for possible action request to amend the development uses section of the Town Center Development Standards Manual to allow motor vehicle sales used at a primary use within a specified geographical area in Town Center and to provide for other related matters. Staff has no recommendation. Give a staff report, please. Mr. Chairman, uh, this proposed uh, amendment would allow automotive uh, sales used as a sole primary use within the town center um, uh, special area plan. Uh, limitations on this would require a non-waivable minimum of two acres, minimum of a 25,000 square foot building, and geographically limited only to the auto mall within the Centennial Center. Um, as you stated, staff has no recommendation on this item. Thank you. This was noticed as a public hearing and from the public like to be heard on this item. Seeing no one, I'll close it and go to the commission for discussion. Commissioner DeSalvio. Mr. Chairman, if there's just for an abundance of time, if there's no other comments, I'd like to just make a motion to approve text amendment 73931. I think there's a motion on the floor. Please cast your votes. motion carries. Mr. Chairman, that item will move forward for the City Council's consideration in ordinance form. Thank you. Moving on to Text Amendment 73989, Applicant Owner, City of Las Vegas, for possible action to amend LVMC Chapters 19.12, Permitted Uses, and 19.18, Definitions and Measures to Provide Updated Standards and Definition for a Short-Term residential use in, in mixed use in multifamily residential developments and to provide for other related matters. Staff has no recommendation. Can I get the staff report, please? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this proposed amendment, uh, if adopted by the Las Vegas City Council, would allow up to 5% of a multifamily residential or within the resen residential component of a mixed use development to be used as short-term rentals. The 660-foot distance separation will continue to apply to the parcel containing multifamily, residential, or mixed-use development, but not to the units within the development. Um, and as stated, staff does not have a recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this was noticed as a public hearing. Anyone from the public like to be heard on these items? Please come to the microphone. Give your name and address for the record. Give you a couple minutes to talk about. Good evening, Commissioners. Jonas Wolverton, the Ogden, uh, 150 Las Vegas Boulevard North, Unit 1011. Um, thank you for your time. Um, we're part of a group called the Ogden's Home. Uh, we're owner residents, and we believe strongly in the mission of downtown as a cultural and uh, economic beacon for Las Vegas. I'm strongly opposed to item. Um, agenda item number 11, which would allow 5% or 14 units at the Ogden. Um, I want to imagine a scenario. If you guys have houses, um, if anybody has a house, it's a lot different than living in a condo. Imagine where in your house, um, in your backyard, you'd have 14 tents pitched out with complete strangers not chosen by you. They would have access to your pool your barbecue, your gym, and they'd have to walk down your hallway in your house and to get in and out of the house. Now imagine each of the 14 tents in your backyard had on average three different strangers per week, 52 weeks out of the year. Over the course of the year, you would have 2,184 complete strangers camped out in your backyard using your facilities. So now, I hope you understand a little bit what it's like um, to have that many people uh, in this proposal coming through the Ogden. Um, 
you apply, the other problem about the Ogden is that we have um, at least 25 plus illegal current short term rentals in the Ogden. And so you can tack on those 2,184 if you apply the same math to the 25 illegal STRs. That's an additional 3,900 strangers for a grand total of 6,000 strangers coming through your door every year. And believe me, approval of agenda item number 11 would encourage those 25 illegal ones to continue operating with impunity. We need downtown, uh, we need downtown residents. We need people who are there to support the downtown community, arts, cultural businesses. Um, this scenario, it actually uh, doesn't solve anything. So I'd like to consider that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jonas. Name and address, please, for the record. Jeff Belcher, uh, 150 Las Vegas Boulevard uh, North, Unit 1713, the Ogden. Um, my husband and I moved to Las Vegas seven years ago, and we um, lived out in the burbs. We found ourselves going downtown uh, frequently, and uh, were drawn to the excitement, the energy, the vision of what downtown was to be and uh, decided to move downtown. Bought it into a luxury condominium um, and quickly found ourselves with an unexpected uh, issue on our front porch of being uh, the short-term rental activity. Um, I will not be redundant and talk about all the safety and security concerns that I'm sure you've heard a hundred times. I've spoken to city council several times. I just realized I've never spoken to the planning commission before, but thank you for allowing me to be here. Um, but, uh, you know, I mean, the, we, we were not, the, the Ogden was not built to be a hotel. It doesn't have hotel grade security. Uh, we're not prepared to deal with uh, guests uh, in uh, the amenities, uh, the pool, et cetera, things like that. So um, uh, Jonas did the math, but I think it was actually on the conservative side. Uh, if we were to take the 5% that is in this uh, proposal times the 275 units, it's 14.75, so round up to 15 times the three times the 52, and we're talking at least 2,300 um, uh, guests uh, of these STRs, and that's a really, really conservative uh, estimate. So I live on the 17th floor, and I have uh, witnessed four extremely active illegal STR uh, units on my floor. And um, it's just a constant parade of people you don't know. Um, uh, I'll just leave it at that. I'm not going to go into each of the details of those units, but um, it's quite uh, frustrating between noise, between trash, between, um, again, background checks, things like that. It's just uh, very frustrating. So uh, why the hotels aren't up in arms about this, I'm not sure. Uh, we literally have the El Cortez across the street, of course down the street, the Downtown Grand, the D, the Golden Nugget, and a hundred other, uh, not a hundred, but several other casinos that I'm sure will be very interested that they are potentially losing customers to a condominium uh, that was not designed to be a hotel. So um, with all that said, uh, I just want to reiterate, our, if we had our druthers, uh, we absolutely would mostly want a ban. Just gone from the city of Las Vegas. If we can't have that, at least support a historic district uh, where they're banned in, uh, like the French Quarter did. Uh, right now we have one legal STRs in our building. Um, we're actually okay with that. We know what unit it is. We all know what floor it's on. We all know to watch the activity of that unit. Um, it's all this other activity that's just rampant and it's really hard to um, control. So that, uh, the, the last, uh, well, we're, we're, I wouldn't, I, I'm not here to support the 5%, but the, to me that feels an extremely arbitrary number. Again, when you say, uh, say a minimum of 2,300. Mr. Chairman, I, I, I think I've heard enough from here with all due respect. Yeah. Mr. Mr. Jeff, if you could please wrap up on your, on your comments, that would, that would help me. Thank you. That's all if you have any further, I mean, the, the, we, we did hear in the first portion uh, as well. I will just say that the 5% is an extremely arbitrary number um, because it invites 2,300 guests. Um, you cannot guarantee my safety and security in the Ogden if you allow one in. So um, it only takes one, and it almost did. So thank Th you, for, thank your you for your comments. Thank you for coming on the record. Name Hal Jones, 7811 Dana Point Court. Um, I'm against. Uh, any short-term rentals. As I mentioned, I'm retired. I was a chief strategist at a Fortune 50 company. I ran research groups. I really didn't want to spend my retirement dealing with this, but I mentioned earlier I've done a lot of research and I've actually uh, been in contact with a lot of people around the world, uh, people in government um, and outside of government on this. There's a couple of trends I think you need to think about that are happening relative to this. 
People are setting up businesses, they're buying properties, and what's happening is that they're turning them into timeshares. So they create a business with 50 people, they go buy a $2 million home, or they go buy a $2 million condo, right? And now all of a sudden it's a timeshare. Now, the next spin they put on it is they actually turn into a short-term rental their week, okay? The next thing that's happening, I don't know if you saw the news, in Nashville, Airbnb is building an apartment complex. They're pushing the people that move in there to rent their apartments out 180 days or more during the year. So I, for me, this is a very strategic discussion. This is not a tactical thing. How do you want residential living to operate in the future? I, I, for me, residential means it's a place I'm living. It's my primary residence. And you, you can define living in a lot of ways. It's completely different than a hotel, motel, resort. When you go to one of those places, you have a primary residence that you return to. When it's your residence, it's your residence. You're not visiting. So with that, I just would like to ask that you think through some of these things for the long term and what doors you're opening up and allowing this. I would suggest very strongly that you don't allow them in high rises, period. Further, I'd like to see them banned, period. Thank you, okay. Mr. Jones. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Name and address, please, for the record. Yes, hi. It's Chris Jones, uh, 7811 Dana Point Court. Um, I'm here on behalf of the what's called the Buffalo Coalition. It's a um, community of probably 300 or so homes. Uh, we've been working with the city as an association with regards to this topic. And I just want to mention that the folks back here have spent enormous amount of their retirement or otherwise working life on this issue now. And um, the biggest thing really is the fundamental. These are homes, whether you, like you, you know, my husband said, you live in them. I have my grandchildren come and visit. Is that something I want some strange person that we don't know, we have not had validated or checked out or no background checks, walking around in our neighborhood and driving cars at all hours of the day and night when the vulnerability of the people there who chose to be there, who purchased homes and put their lives into those homes are at risk for people that we never even asked to come. And so it's, it's like an invasion of our lives when we were the ones in the first place to buy into these communities and invest in Las Vegas and pay our taxes. And this isn't a, an issue of whether uh, um, our STR is legal or illegal. It really comes down to people transitioning in and out very quickly and the risk, um, you know, the odds, it's like casino, you know, the odds of having somebody good or somebody bad, you, you don't know. And so, um, I, again, I'd like to say the Buffalo Coalition, 300 and something homes, we are against STRs. Thank you, thank you. Thank Before you, you uh, go, I just want to, no, to the next speaker, please. Uh, I just want to let you both know that this is for specific to mixed use and multifamily. Yep. Uh, yep. Not not residential. So right. if you want to add some more comments to that, I'd, I'd love to hear them. Okay, your name and address, please. Well, we just want to come up and support them also because again, we've all put a lot of money in this, and I think again with the taxes, that it's not fair that people are running hotels, condos, putting people in here and not paying the property tax. I, I don't think Las Vegas is a rich city that we have a flush of cash. We need money for more police. I need your name and address. Oh, Dina Cianchetti. Thank you, Dina. We need more cash for more policemen, more code violation, school teachers. I mean, wh who, who's in charge of collecting the taxes when we're all paying our taxes and these people are making ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars a month, and they're paying three, three percent. They're not paying their tax. They're not paying more taxes. If you go to the MGM, you got a resort fee. You've got all kinds of fees you got to pay. Why aren't you guys going after them to get the money so we can have money for more cops and more police and code violations? That's what I don't get. It's not a fair playing ground. Thank you for your comments. Thank you. Can I get your name and address for, address for the record, please? Hi there. I'm Terry O'Rourke, 2000 Palm Canyon Court. We're hearing all the negative things about short-term rentals. What are short-term rentals doing for us? Are they, are they doing any, are they bringing anything positive to us? We have nine of them in our neighborhood. Three of them are licensed. One of them follows the rules. And they've just, do you see? We're, we're upset and we spent hours and hours of our life coming to the meetings and getting together. We have 72 active neighborhood watch um, participants in our neighborhood. We get together every Thursday for coffee. We go on walks together. 
you know it's a very tight community and this has uh, these short term rentals have just undermined um, the security and the positiveness of our whole neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Can I get your name and address please for the record? Uh, Tom Delio, 2231 Diamond Bar. Uh, so with regard to this uh, Ogden and the multi-use, uh, there's a lot of common areas in these buildings. So I don't know how you distinguish that from the HOAs where currently they have to all agree that the STR is located there. So uh, in any of these cases, we should allow the, the building to and the residents in the building to um, uh, uh, agree to the uh, presence of the STRs. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Anyone else? We have three microphones if you'd like to come up. Okay, it looks like last person. Can you get your name and address for the record, please? Certainly, Chairman. Uh, Matthew Seibert, 630 South 4th Street. <clears throat> On this side in particular, um, you're absolutely right. This is pertaining to mixed-use developments um, or the residential component of a, a mixed-use uh, um, development. And I think this is something that, that really the code needs. You know, uh, the 660 rule, as we've all seen, isn't a... Uh, one-size-fits-all rule. I think it's more applicable to residential areas than it would be to a high-rise development such as the Ogden, which uh, I know some people came to, uh, you know, uh, voice their, their, their concern about this amendment as it relates to the Ogden. Um, and speaking of that point, as, as, as somebody that represents several of the applicants in the Ogden, I would also like to point out that, well, I do appreciate the opposition's time coming down here all the time. I'm down here all the time as well. Um, for the case of the Ogden, We've been working every week with the HOA, their attorneys, the attorney for the opposition, which I don't know if he's not forwarding the information to them that, that we are providing, but we are trying everything we can to, to make this a, a safe and compatible and harmonious uh, environment for all parties involved. Um, I think this is something that is appropriate for mixed-use developments because the way to, to enforce these in a mixed-use development or a apartment complex would be through the CCNRs, um, which at the Ogden, they do permit short-term residential rentals. If they would like to, to reach out and, and continue with these negotiations, I think that we have some good ideas that would help you know, protect their interest in the building as well. Um, but with that, I would just like to say that for, for these types of developments, the CCNRs are the appropriate mechanism for, for regulating this type of use. And with that, thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna close the public portion. Um, Commissioner Schlaman. I'm happy to start if you, if you yes, want to. Yes, please. Um, I have three short-term rentals. Well, I had three short-term rentals in my neighborhood. I didn't own them personally. Neighbors owned them. I've never had an issue out of any, uh, any of them over a three-year period with the exception of one. So every time everybody comes up and says, hey, there's an issue with, I mean, you don't know who's going to be in there and this and that. That's all based on who's re uh, regulating that, that house and, and so on and so forth. Now, in saying that, I'll say short-term rentals do not fit every neighborhood. And in a lot of neighborhoods, I don't believe that they should, should be in those neighborhoods. And I do not believe that we should have um, be accepting applications. My personal belief is that we shouldn't be accepting applications that are less than 660 feet because we do not need to saturate these neighborhoods. Um, over and over and over again, you can go back through the past two years of, uh, of planning commission, um, Chairman Cherry, uh, Cherry and myself has always said, you know, this is not appropriate in high rises because you know they get destroyed. You got people going down internal like internal hallways, and you tear up elevators and everything else. Unlike my community, which is brand new where you just walk up to the outside, um, you're not going to be carrying in luggage and tearing stuff up. Not that I necessarily approve, but I don't disapprove of them in my, my neighborhood either because I hadn't had that big of an issue. I rent short-term rentals every time I go out in town, and so and I love it. And I don't party and turn up the music and everything else, but maybe I'm just the exception to the norm. Um, so, however, there are certain areas such as, and I'll repeat this, and the Planning Commission's probably going to get tired of hearing me say this, from Charleston out to 95 and from Maryland Parkway up to the 15 and the Arts District, I don't really have that big of an issue if there's, you know, uh, in the 
two-story and three-story multifamily apartments if they want to have two or three short-term rentals in there, or if they um, want to have them around the, the Founders District, which is where all the attorney's offices are. So, uh, because most of those are professional offices, they go home at night, even if somebody turns up the radio, it's not affecting people. Um, it's not a traditional neighborhood like the people out here pro probably live in. So I think there are certain areas that this is acceptable and certain areas that it's not. And CCNRs and um, I think the, the Ogden, uh, I don't think they have rules on short-term rentals yet and their CCNRs, which I think you should put in place because as uh, uh, Judge Figler pointed out and sent me a, a uh, article this past week off the city's website. If the CCNRs state that you can't have short-term rentals, then you can't have them from a business licensing standpoint. So that's something that y'all probably should fix, even though we we traditionally don't approve those. But I do feel that there might be certain older apartments that are 50, 60 years old that, I mean, kind of like the one that was on Maryland Parkway and and, and Lewis, that was approved a couple of years ago, five of them, uh, felt that, that was appropriate. So I don't, I don't think that, you know, having 5% of the total units is a bad thing, but I'm also not for having them in, you know, especially, you know, uh, within 660 feet from each other. So those are my comments. So I do appreciate everybody's comments, and I, I respect everybody's comments that come out today. Thank you. Thanks. And if I could just, uh, Commissioner Roush, before I go to you, just chime in a little bit. I, I you know, I, I live in a high rise. I'm affected by this. Um, we have it in our CCNRs that it's a six month lease. And so we're able to police it. And uh, if we find it and someone wasn't, doesn't want to uh, adhere to the rules, they could find and we get through. And we've had incidents uh, of guests coming through. And, and for a, a high-rise building today, the condos, they weren't set up for uh, the hotel environment, for the transient environment. And that's why I've historically voted no on, on stuff that goes into the Ogden, uh, the way it sits, because I know the effect it has one that's approved now. Um, but I will say there, there is something that's happening across the country that I, I think I know I need to pay attention to and, and watch what's happening is with new projects, and I'm speaking specifically to mixed-use condo and multifamily. I, I look at them short-term residential houses, which is one issue where, uh, as Commissioner Schlotman said, there's maybe a fit in some areas, maybe not a fit in other areas. I've voted no on quite a bit of them in, that are in downtown, that an area that doesn't have CCNRs or, or no way to regulate anything. Uh, but specific to multifamily, which is one owner that owns multiple units. They might own 10, 200 units. I don't have any heartburn about having sh multiple short-term rentals inside of a, a ground-up project that's coming uh, on the horizon that it's been disclosed and the people moving in there as opposed to the Ogden that was kind of taken over by a wave, our community was taken over by a wave of short-term rentals and we're dealing with the, with the problems of that that came this way. Uh, and the city is still playing catch up on how we get there. And, and like uh, uh, Mr. Figler said earlier, they're doing a better job and they're going to continue to do better to regulate those things. But there's still a long ways to go with, with, with everything. But again, specific to uh, multifamily, I don't have any heartburn. In fact, I, and, and I say that because it, it's going to be a way that communities, like in that boundary that Commissioner Schlotman said, when buildings are built, uh, as construction costs go up, as uh, it's more difficult to build in a, in a downtown environment. There, there has to be ways to help out with absorption, with financing, to get to a, a permanent project that is in a community that makes it more viable. So I, I live at Las Vegas Boulevard in Charleston. I want to see, I'd love to see apartments that are down there that are active and people walking around, whether it's short-term residential or it's people living there if it's set up that way from the beginning. It's, it's, to me, it's fundamentally different if there's a plan on how to, how to handle transiency. Now, with the same thing with, uh, uh, with condos. I, I couldn't, the way it sits right now, and I've never seen, nothing's ever come to me by way of meeting to say, hey, 
there's a plan now to address through the HOA how we're going to help homeowners uh, and short-term rentals coexist in the same building. That hasn't happened yet. And, and, and I understand uh, the current uh, team there inherited something that doesn't have docks and people bought into it and, uh, and now there, there's a consequence because of that. Um, but uh, as it sits for the Ogden, but now if, if, if a ground up high rise project came forward and they wanted short term rentals in there and that was, it was in this zone that's going to be built. It's not going to be, be, be built in the neighborhood. It's going to be built next to where I live on Las Vegas Boulevard in Charleston or in that core. Uh, I can see that as a tool that helps get that project one off the ground, which will improve our neighborhood, in my opinion, um, and make it active. I'm not saying a, a complete project of short-term rentals, but a percentage. And I even have a little bit of heartburn of putting a percentage on it right now because in some cases, quite honestly, uh, in other, pl other cities, it's used as a tool um, to help get the project up and going. But again, it, it fundamentally comes down to how is management going to handle the influx of people that come through the building? We couldn't handle it our building. We have a, a door person. We have a property management person. They can't keep up with giving out key fobs and registering people. They're just not set up for it. And so we would suffer if we were the Ogden in the situation they're in. Um, so I, I, I'm in support of something that, again, specific to mixed use and multifamily, um, knowing what it can do to help be a catalyst in areas to get there with a plan of, of how it's handled. Um, so I, I'm going to keep going with discussion, but that, that's where I'm sitting right now. And I, I, again, I'm, you know, it says 5% right now. Um, and I know this c goes against what m might seem right, but I, I'd be open to more depending on how it's regulated. But again, on the existing stuff, I, I couldn't support just saying the Ogden without any type of plan or rule or anything be fit within that box. I just, I'm still sitting with no when it comes to that. So Commissioner Rush. Thank you. I appreciate your input and giving me the floor. Um, nobody wants these, and I think that that's become quite evident at the hearings um, that we have every every month. It takes us two or three hours to get through short-term rentals, and I'm going to be brief because we're going to be here again until midnight or one or two or however long it takes to get through our 130 item, items, some odd items. But the, the things I want to say are very heartfelt, and we've been through a lot of these meetings now and we're all starting to try to coalesce around a good solution. What happens, and, and this particular bill is not bad and it's not good in some ways either. I think it just needs a little bit more work. Uh, there are unintended consequences that happen every time we make decisions and we're learning as we go. Uh, if we are to make decisions on where short-term rentals can go, then that affects the fabric of that neighborhood. It changes the character of that neighborhood. Um, it's easiest to say absolutely no, but there'd be a contingent of people that would say that we're living in the dark ages and we've got our head in the sand because the reality is is that people are going to do what they're going to do regardless if you don't put in a provision to do it correct, to do it right, as Mr. Raper said, and I agree with him as well. Um, so, so let's not bootleg this. Let's try to figure out how to do it right. But that said, the devil's in the details. Um, it's not a bad bill, but I would advise council to consider removing high-rise condos from the equation because it's too intense of a living situation. I would advise council to consider carving out certain historic neighborhoods, including the legal district. Imagine if we allowed only short-term rentals in the legal district because now we've backed into that's the only area that's left. And what happens to the character of the legal district? Suddenly it becomes overrun with short-term rentals. So there needs to be some sort of a formula and some sort of a compromise. And I, that's, that's where we need to do a little bit more work. We need to figure out how many are allowed in a certain area. What's the distance separation? What type of a use? Should it be a four unit complex? Should it be a 40 unit complex? And then it goes also to the applicant. How qualified are they? Are they capable? 
Um, do they speak English? Do they understand how to put in cameras, how to respond, you know, to the scenario? We've had a variety of different applicants come before us and not all of them are created equal. And I'm just, I'm throwing that out there for everyone's consideration because this isn't just a one size fits all scenario. Just because you come up with the idea and you want to come down here and you want to make some money and turn it into a business doesn't mean that we need to approve it. And it doesn't mean that it's a good solution for our neighborhoods. So how do you choose when and where that's the question we need to spend more time on. And, you know, I'm just going to say that some neighborhoods are more open to the sharing community. I mean, I've had just as many people, well, not as many, but I've had a lot of people reach out to me and say, hey, you know, we're for this. We like the idea. We, we, we rent our car. We, we share our car. We share our computer. I mean, things that I don't even imagine, you know? And so I don't want to be uh, short-sighted, but I want to be protective of our neighborhoods too. So right now I'm probably not in favor of this because I think it needs a little more work. Thank you. Uh, any other comments from commissioners? No. I would like to make a motion on the item. Mr. Chairman, um, Commissioner Slavik. I am going to go ahead and side with uh, uh, Commissioner Roush, I'm sorry. Um, as I, I, I do feel that it needs a little bit more work. Um, as of right now, this would be loving down to, you know, the maximum 5% of the units. As you, you, you express it, you feel that maybe 5% is too low on certain new developments that might be coming in. Um, and based on Commissioner Roush's uh, comments, I, I, I'll, I'll make motion on uh, item number 11, TXT 73989 uh, to, uh, to, deny, to deny this application and for staff to make the recommendation to the city council um, that uh, they look at that 5% and maybe look at taking some of these historic neighborhoods out of the, uh, out in the realm and uh, we'll go from there. Mr. Chair? Yep. Could I ask, does the, does the commission have a recommendation as to what that number should be? And any rationale with regard to what that number should be? The, above the 5%? Yeah, yeah, you know, just I, to, just because you're recommended by the council, and they may want to know exactly what your thought pattern was with regard to yeah. the percentage. I, I know for, for me, and I'll chime in here, is that uh, on a new project coming forward, um, uh, a ground up project or someone that bought something that's a total rehab it's not so much uh, a number for me it's it's the plan on how it's actually managed and disclosed to residents uh, to make it all coexist Th that's what it is for me I, I would agree and because it could be a hundred percent if it's a six unit department complex that is dilapidated that's being being put together, so I'd, I'd hate to put like a 5% or 25% or 50% only to limit us or us from not not even being able to accept application on something like that. So I'd like to be able to look at that in the future. So I think, uh, Director Summerfield, I think you have all of our comments that you can uh, give to City Council. So my motion is for uh, denial of TXT 73. There's a motion on the floor. Please cast your vote. That motion carries. Mr. Chairman, that item will move forward to the City Council in ordinance form, and I will pass along the comments uh, and uh, suggestions of the Planning Commission. Thank you. And, and for the final uh, item number 13 of the special Commission meeting, citizens partic participation. Public comment during this portion of the agenda must be limited to matters within the jurisdiction of the Planning Commission. No subject may be acted upon the Planning Commission unless that subject is on the agenda and is scheduled for action. If you wish to be heard, come to the podium, give your name for the record. The amount of discussion of any single subject, as well as the amount of time any single speaker is allowed, may be limited. Anyone from the public like to be heard? Seeing no one, will close this uh, special count commission meeting.